Well, Father Stephen Brock, the person I'm introducing, asked to have a very, very, very brief introduction. I said, I can't give it completely brief introduction. I can't just say, here's Father Stephen Brock. Let's welcome him. Um, he is at, uh, in medieval philosophy at the Pontifical University Santa Croce in Rome. He's here from Rome, so it's very much colder than what he's used to. He is a brilliant scholar of Aquinas. Um, he is, let's see, I've, I've taught from Action and Conduct, and I gather that this book is about to be reprinted and will be slightly cheaper than it was when I bought it, which is good. Um, he's uh, also the author of a doctoral dissertation freely and readily available online called <laughs> The Legal Character of Natural Law in St. Thomas Aquinas, which I heartily recommend. It's about the best thing I've ever read on natural law in Aquinas. Um, and he's a White Sox fan. Please <laughs> join me in welcoming Father Stephen Brock. Well, thank you very much, Professor Vogler. Yeah. Those are very kind words. It's true, I am a White Sox fan, and I'm proud of it. Well, it's an honor, it's certainly an honor to be here and a great pleasure. I'm tempted to reminisce a little bit since I studied here, but I'll spare you that. So let's just get down to business. Has everybody got the handout? I had this handout made. I do not have a, a PowerPoint presentation. I would call this power paper. You know, I think we can call this power paper. You can think, think of all the things you can do with the paper. You, know, you, can, you can go back and forth to anything on the paper, even no matter what I'm talking about. Right? You can't do that with a PowerPoint. You can take notes, you can doodle, you can make a paper airplane. You can take it home with you. You can't do any of those things with the PowerPoint. The uh, article of the Summa Theologia that contains the five ways is, I suppose, it's Thomas Aquinas's best-known piece of writing. And it continues to generate a lot of discussion and it may be, I think it may very well be, that the most controversial of the five ways is the third way. You can find objections to it of just about every sort, logical objections, scientific objections, theological objections, even Thomistic objections. There are some Thomists who are not very pleased with it. And even apart from the objections, there's quite a wide variety of interpretations of it that have been offered. I'm, going to, I'm just going to try to offer my own reading of it. It's not, I shouldn't say my own reading, it's not at all totally original. The basic line has been present in the literature for some time and it's endorsed by some very eminent readers of Thomas. What I'm going to try to do is take that line and simply carry it through. I, I haven't seen anyone really try to carry it through, through the whole argument. And I think that can be done. And by doing so, I think a number of the objections can be, can be dealt with. But let me just anticipate what, in a way, might be the most important objection of all, um, and which, in any case, was one of my chief reasons for choosing this topic for the lecture. Um, before going into the third way itself, let me just cite that first passage on the back of the, back of the sheet, the quotation from Martin Heidegger. It's a famous passage, a passage, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. He says, being as the engendering ground needs to be properly grounded in that which it grounds. I'm not going to try to explain that. We can just, but, but he goes on. This is the first cause as causa sui. That is the right name for the god of philosophy. To this god, man can neither pray nor sacrifice. Before the causa sui, man can neither fall to his knees in awe 
nor before this God can he play music and dance. Of course, the passage does not mention the third way explicitly, but once we've gone through it, once we've gone through the third way, I think it will be easy to see how, how these remarks of Heidegger's might have a bearing on it, a very direct bearing. And I will want to say, want to propose that, that mm, the interpretation that I'm going to offer makes it possible to say something important in response to Heidegger. But it's going to take some time to get there, so you have to be patient. Let me say just a word or two about the five ways overall. Thomas calls them ways of proving that there is a God. He uses that word, pro pro probare. He sees them as instances of one of Aristotle's types of scientific proof or demonstration. And so I think they should be judged accordingly for their quality as proofs. That's how we should judge them. At the same time, his presentation of them in the Summa is extremely bare bones, very sketchy. Why that's so is an interesting question. I'm not going to address it here. We can talk about it maybe later. But for that reason, it's, com it's very common for interpreters to try to flesh them out a bit from using other passages from Thomas's works. And in particular, in the case of the Third Way, a number of interpreters find, and I agree with them, that we get a good deal of help from Thomas's commentary on Aristotle's cosmological treatise, the De Cello. Specifically, his commentary on Book 1, Chapters 11 and 12, which are about the duration of the world. The corresponding sections, if you're interested, of Thomas's commentary are Lessons 24 through 29. And at several places, the language, both the language and the content of those lessons call the third way to mind very much. And I'm not alone in, in finding that they shed a good deal of light on the third way. So in the handout here, I've divided the third way into five kind of unequal parts. It's only for the purposes of exposition. It's not meant to reflect the logic of the, of the argument. It's just for this lecture. Uh, there are also some, there are some issues with the text, the Latin text that we have, mm, because we, the, the, the critical edition, a really critical edition of the Summa hasn't come out yet. Uh, I've mentioned, I mentioned those is issues in the notes, but I'm not going to discuss those because I don't really think they affect what I'm going to say. It doesn't really matter how those are resolved for, for my purposes today. They're fairly small issues, but I thought I should mention them anyway. So at the beginning of the third way, this is step one of the handout, Thomas tells us that it is taken from the possible and the necessary, ex possibile et necessario. Obviously, if we're going to understand the argument, we have to make sure that we've grasped correctly what he means by these terms. And I think that, that so, at least some of the difficulties that people have with the third way are the result of, of misunderstanding the nature of the possibility and the necessity that he's talking about here. So just to clarify these terms, let me dwell on that for a bit. A first point, which comes, becomes quite explicit in the next sentence, is that when he says the possible, possibile, he's using that as a shorthand for possibile esse et non esse. Hmm? able to be and able not to be. We find certain things in reality that are able to be and able not to be. In this sense, the possible stands between the impossible, which is not able to be, right, and the necessary, which is not able not to be. You may be thinking, surely the necessary is also possible. It's also able to be. Hmm? And Thomas would say, well, that's right. In another sense, that's right. Hmm. He, he will allow you to use the word possible in that broader sense, which includes both 
Hmm. It includes both the possible in this narrower sense here and the necessary and excludes only the impossible. But here it has a narrower sense, which excludes both the impossible and the necessary. If this is confusing, if, it's, if this seems strange, I think he would allow us to substitute the word possible here with the word contingent. Hmm. Contingent only means what has both the possibility of being and the possibility of non-being. Hmm. It's neither impossible nor necessary. I think he may have had reasons for not using the word contingent in this particular text, but I don't think he would simply forbid it either. I think we can use it. But whichever word we use, there's also another kind of a potential confusion here, which is much less easy to spot, because nothing in the text of the Third Way alerts us to it. It's, a, it's signaled in the first passage from the De Celo commentary that's on the handout, which is passage B on the handout on the back. You, have to, you do have to turn the paper over. I'm sorry about that. He says, it should be noted that, as the philosopher says in Metaphysics 5, in one way something is called possible or impossible absolutely, namely because in itself it is such that, that it can be true or it cannot be true. There should be an it there, such that it can be true or it cannot be true, on account of the relation between the terms. In another way, something is called possible or impossible for something for that which is able or not able by reason of having or lacking an active power or a passive power. And this is how possible and impossible are taken here, namely that some agent or patient is able or not able. For this meaning is what most befits natural things. So he's saying that in Aristotle in the De Celo is using this meaning of possible and impossible because Thomas is convinced that this is the sense that most befits the kinds of things that Aristotle is talking about. Now here Thomas only speaks about the possible and the impossible, but the same discussion also applies to the necessary, the same distinction, because the concept of the impossible is included in the concept of the necessary. The necessary is what is impossible not to be. So the same distinction about the possible and impossible applies to it. Now, of these two senses of possible and impossible, the one that's more familiar to us nowadays and the one that we're more likely to think of when we read the third way, surely it's the first one. The possibility or impossibility of a proposition's being true. It's the sort of possibility or impossibility which is called logical. And Thomas also speaks of it that way in some places. It's based on how the terms of the proposition, the subject and the predicate of the proposition, are related to each other. If they are compatible with each other, then the proposition can be true. It's possible. If they're incompatible, which is to say if the proposition implies a contradiction, then it cannot be true. The other sort of possibility is what we could call power possibility. Power is something real in things. It's a principle of activity. Thomas distinguishes two sorts of power, that of an agent, here in this text, that of an agent or active power, and that of a patient or a passive power. An example of active power is the power of fire to burn things. Is that okay? is the power of fire to burn things. To this corresponds a passive power, the power to be burned by fire. This is yet another power that the power paper has. It can be burned <coughs> by fire. Not everything has that power, you know. A PowerPoint presentation cannot be burned by fire. You can't burn the presentation, at least not directly. <laughs> We should notice how these two sorts of possibility are related to each other. Everything that is possible in the sense of power possibility is also logically possible. The proposition that asserts it can be true. 
But logical possibility does not entail power possibility. Logical possibility is nothing but the non-incompatibility of the proposition's terms. Nothing in the proposition itself excludes its being true. But this by itself does not mean that things really have what it takes to be as the proposition says or to make the proposition actually true. For instance, while the paper has the, while the, paper has the power to be on fire, it does not have the power to remain unconsumed while on fire. That the paper on fire remain unconsumed is logically possible. The proposition implies no contradiction. But that by itself does not mean that such an event can really happen. It can, only ha it can happen only if, despite the papers lacking the power for it, something or other some other thing in reality, something or other, has the proportionate power to bring it about. So when Moses saw the burning bush, he knew that something else was there too, besides the bush and the fire, to explain it. That a piece of paper or a bush be on fire and resist consumption is logically possible, but that it, that it do so on its own, by its own power, to do it is in no way possible, not even logically. Hmm. There's a contradiction in saying that something does by its own power what it does not have its own power to do. It would both have and not have the power. Hmm. This is important. This idea will come up later, so keep that in mind. Still in the De Celo passage, Thomas says that the second sort of possibility and impossibility, the power sort, is what most befits natural things. So he takes Aristotle to be using that sense. This is very interesting in relation to the third way because Aristotle's text right there concerns the very same sorts of things that the third way concerns. The possibile esse et non esse, the generable and the corruptible, and so forth. That's already one reason for taking the third way's possible and necessary in this sense, the sense of power possibility. Other reasons I think will come out as we go through it. But on the assumption that this is correct, that this is the right reading in the English version of the third way, I have followed Professor Fredoso's translation of possibile esse et non esse as able to be and able not to be, rather than simply possible to be impossible not to be. I think the word able conveys the idea of a power, a capacity in the thing for whatever is being said to be possible for it. So here the topic is specifically power to be and power not to be. Before going on with the third way, I'd also like to introduce another expression and with it a very crucial metaphysical principle for St. Thomas which are also found in the, third, in the De Cello commentary. In the passage we just looked at, Thomas speaks of active or passive power. The word that he uses there for power in Latin is potentia. He's speaking generally about power. But when he speaks specifically about the power to be, he sometimes uses another word. He uses this word in many other contexts also, but he uses the word virtus which I, would, I don't think I would render it as virtue. That doesn't get it across to us. I, but we could very well render it as strength. It takes strength to be, for Thomas. It takes virtus ascendi. And in fact, in an earlier De Cello passage, he explains what this con consists in. This is very interesting. Passage C. He's talking about Averroes. He's addressing a problem which is very complicated, which I won't go into, but he gives us Averroes' view and he disagrees with Averroes. He says, Averroes thought that strength of being, virtus ascendi, pertains only to passive power, which is the power of matter, whereas it pertains more to the power of form, since each thing is through its form. 
Hence, each thing has so much of being and for so long as is the strength of its form. Now, by form here, Thomas means substantial form. That's the factor in a thing, in a substance, upon which its existence, in his view, upon which its existence most immediately depends. With the form, the thing is fully able to exist, and it does exist. Without the form, the thing absolutely cannot exist, even for a moment. If the thing is a living thing, its form is what Thomas calls its soul, following Aristotle. And its existence is what he calls its life. Soul and life, for Thomas, are not quite the same thing. They're not quite the same thing, but they are totally inseparable. A thing begins to live and to be when its soul begins to be present, and it dies or ceases to be when it loses its soul, its form. Here, Thomas contrasts the power of form with the passive power of matter. Of course, bodily things, in order to be, also need matter, obviously. But he says strength of being pertains more to the form. In fact, for Thomas, form is only power to be. It is in no way power not to be. But matter, or at least earthly matter, I'll explain that later, is both power to be and power not to be, in a way. Let me say just a few things about, about that, about matter. It may sound rather strange to speak of being able not to be or having power not to be. Not being doesn't seem to require much power, much strength. And in fact, for Thomas, it's only indirectly that the matter of a th the thing ever constitutes a power in it not to be. It does so insofar as it is a power, the matter is a power to receive a form that is incompatible with the form through which that thing exists. Living things have the power to die and not to be insofar as their matter can be acted upon it's a passive power, it's acted upon, and receives some form that is incompatible with their souls. And really, it's in a similar way that matter is even a power to be. The matter of a thing doesn't make it be by itself. It's not sufficient. The thing's real strength of being resides in its form. But matter is, in a sense, a kind of remote principle of being insofar as it's able to receive the form. Still in step, in step one of, of the third way, Thomas is referring to these processes that matter undergoes when he speaks of things that are generated or corrupted. A thing is generated when its matter receives its form. It is corrupted when its form is displaced by the form of another thing. So he says, certain things are found to be generated and corrupted, and as a result, to be and not to be. He says, certain things. Thomas was aware, mainly through Aristotle, of philosophers who thought that nothing was really generated or corrupted, and that all the changes that we observe are only modifications or rearrangements or changes of state of things that are essentially the same and are always there. It's sort of as, as someone might say that really snow and water and steam are the same thing. They're really H2O. Mm -hmm. Bailey said everything is water, right, in some condition or state or another. Thomas, like Aristotle, rejects that view. He thinks some changes cannot be understood in this way. They're too radical. He thinks that when a cow is changed into a carcass, the whole way of acting of the cow and the whole way of being acted upon changes. The whole way of holding together changes. And the carcass cannot be changed straight back into a cow in the way that, say, snow can be changed straight back into water. 
So the, the very nature of the thing differs. It's no longer the same being. The being that was the cow no longer exists. It's not the same being anymore. And Thomas thinks that all the beings on the surface of the earth, and between the earth and the moon, are things that come into being and pass away. Animals and plants and minerals and earth and water and fire and air. Their species go on, their species may go on indefinitely, but the individuals come into being and pass away. However, this is extremely important. Again, like Aristotle, Thomas thinks that not all bodily beings are of this sort. Not all beings come in, not all bodies come into being and pass away for him. Nothing from the moon on up does. The heavenly bodies are naturally able to exist for an infinite time, he says. They need never have been generated and they need never corrupt. And in fact, in those chapters of the De Celo that I mentioned, Aristotle undertakes a long discussion aimed at showing that such bodies cannot have been generated and cannot corrupt. Their natures have only the power to be. Even in their matter, they have a special sort of matter, there is no power not to be. They are not contingent beings. They are necessary beings, and Thomas says that quite, quite often, actually. They are necessary beings. Obviously, the third way says nothing about the heavenly bodies, if you've read through it. It does not ex assume that there are necessary beings. Proving that there are is one of its main aims. Okay? But it shouldn't be too surprising that Aristotle's treatment of the heavenly bodies turns out to be pertinent. For instance, in that discussion that I just mentioned of Aristotle's, he argues that what is able not to be cannot be either ungenerated or incor incorruptible. <coughs> if it's able not to be, it must be generated and it must be corruptible. It naturally comes into being and it naturally passes away. That is to say, it, has an, it naturally has a finite duration in being. And this bears very, very, very directly on the second step of the third way. And as we'll see, a remark by it, about it by Thomas sheds a lot of light on that step. So, moving on. Supposing that some beings are able to be and able not to be, Thomas now argues that not all beings can be so. That covers steps two and three, that, that whole argument. Step two says this, it is impossible for all the things that are to be so. For that which is able not to be at some time is not. Well, it's a very strong claim, isn't it? That which is able not to be at some time it isn't. Some readers have conjectured that Thomas must be supposing some version of what is called the principle of plenitude. Okay. By this principle, everything that is possible is actually realized at some time. But in fact, in the De Celo commentary itself, Thomas rejects the principle of plenitude. He says, very simply, many things that can come about do not come about, period. So he rejects that principle. If we want to understand step two, we must also keep in mind that he is talking, again, in terms of power possibility, not logical possibility. In particular, he is not saying that such a thing's being forever, a thing which is able not to be, he is not saying that it's being forever is not logically possible. After all, he believes that naturally mortal human beings, who are certainly able not to be, before the fall, he believes they had the gift of immortality. And he also believes that after rising, human beings will never die again. That will be by the power of God. Thomas is only saying that such things do not have their own power to be forever. On their own, they cannot avoid perishing. They're living forever on their own is a logical impossibility. It is like a piece of paper's being on fire and remaining unconsumed on its own. 
It has been suggested that Thomas would have had to grant that a simple inanimate body, such as a rock, although able not to be, would go on forever if it were not subject to the deteriorating influences of other bodies. That is, if it were, so to speak, floating by itself in an empty space. You can just imagine a rock going on forever. But that too, is, if, if it's a possibility at all, it's a merely logical possibility, not a natural possibility for Thomas. Thomas does not think that a rock's floating in otherwise empty space is a physical possibility, a natural possibility. Subjection to deteriorating influences, nat influences is natural for a rock. And so speaking generally, that which is naturally able not to be Mm, with the real, under the real conditions that are natural for it, at some time is not. At what time? Interpreters differ about this. Mm. Is it that the thing must begin to be, so that in the time before it begins, it is not? Or is it that the thing must cease to be, so that in the time after it ceases, it is not? Well, if the De Cello commentary is at, is at all an indication, Thomas's answer is both. What is able to be and able not to be, he says there, is what can at some time be and at some time not be. And after working through Aristotle's arguments, he tells us again that such a thing can be for only a finite time. I'm not going to try to lay out Aristotle's arguments, that would take an infinite time, I think. That would be. <laughs> but I think the third way's phrase, quandoque non, it, non est, at some time is not, can, seen, can be seen simply as a reminder of this thesis that such a thing can only be for a finite time sandwiched between times when it is not. So what Thomas is saying is that what is naturally able not to be is not naturally able to be for an infinite time. No such thing is naturally capable of unlimited duration. The natural power to be, sorry, the natural power not to be, that power of matter to take on another form, and the natural power to be for an infinite time are incompatible powers. Why is that? This is kind of the central question, really. Because Thomas answers that question in the De Cello commentary in a very remarkable way. And this is text D. First sentence says, what naturally is for an infinite time is necessary. That is, it is not something that is able to be and able not to be. It is only able to be. It is not able not to be. And he goes on. For it is necessary that each thing be as much as the nature of things allows, because something does not cease to be except when it is no longer able to be, since all things desire to be. Omnia appetunt esse, he says. By nature, everything endures just as long as it can. He had said the same thing in a slightly different way a few pages earlier in the commentary. I haven't put that here, but I'll mention it. The context is an objection against the thesis that what can go on forever is necessary and not contingent, as Aristotle and Thomas are saying it is. The objection is that what goes on for some time may very well have the possibility during any part of that time of not going on. For instance, he gives this example, someone may stay home all day and nevertheless his being away from home part of the day is not impossible, for he is not at home all day by necessity. And we can add if instead he were away from home part of the day, that would not be by necessity either. Right now, in fact, some people may be thinking, I could have stayed home. Some people here may be thinking that. They have the power, it's possible for them to be at home. 
Now, Thomas agrees with what the objection says about staying at home. He agrees with that. But he says, enduring in being is not like staying home. Quote, for the power of being is not open to opposites with respect to the time in which one is able to be. In other words, so long as something is able to be, it has its form, either it has no power at all not to be, and it will go on forever, or its power not to be is closed, obstructed, by its power to be, by the form. The form, as long as it's there, prevents the matter from taking on any other form. And why is that? He gives us the reason. Because all things desire to be, and each thing is just as much and just as long as it is able to be. And so whatever always is, is so not contingently, but by necessity. It can be forever, and therefore it must be, because it must be as long as it can be. By contrast, not, every, not everyone desires to stay home as long as they are able to. The desire isn't there. That's the factor. Even while they retain their power to stay home, their power to go out, can be actualized. But a thing's power not to be cannot be actualized unless and until the thing has lost its power to be. It's a big difference. Now, in other places, Thomas does recognize that the being of a thing might get cut short. Its duration might get cut short in a violent way or an unnatural way so that it does not last as long as it is naturally able to last. He recognizes that. But that only happens in things that do have the natural ability not to be, which is to say things with matter capable of forms contrary to their own form. And all such things do have a natural limit to their duration in any case. This again is because their natural conditions involves subjection to corrupting influences by which contrary forms are eventually induced into their matter. You might say Thomas wouldn't think, wouldn't agree, wouldn't think it possible that there be the, the elves in the Lord of the Rings you know, who can live forever unless they're killed. If, you, if you're the type of thing that can be killed, then you're not the type of thing that can live forever in the first place. What is able to be for an unlimited time has either no matter at all or matter not able to receive a contrary form. It is altogether indestructible. As Father Duan says, power to exist forever is pretty tough stuff. <laughs> it seems to me then that underlying the thesis that whatever is able not to be at some time is not lies this principle. Everything naturally desires to be as much and as long as it can. At the heart of the third way is what I would call the natural love of being. It belongs to all beings because all beings have power to be. They have form. And form as such is not only power to be, but also inclination to be, desire to be. Thomas says that a thing's form holds the thing in being. It's, it's a determination to the being of the thing, inclination. And he also says, every form tends as much as it can toward perpetual being. So it's the nature of form here. In sum, what is able to be forever must be forever. It's not logical necessity. It's the necessity of this natural love. So now I've explained my title. That's my title, logic or love. Not logical necessity, but the necessity of this natural love of being. But if it is the case that anything that is able to be for an infinite time is not able not to be for an infinite time, then what is able, to, what is able not to be for an infinite time is not able to be for an infinite time. Figure that out. That's kind of tricky. But since what can be for an infinite time must be, necessarily is, what is able not to be for an infinite time can't be for an infinite time. It must stop. 
At some time, it is not. And that's the thought governing step two of the third way. Now we come to what is almost certainly the most controversial move in the third way. And this is the move that even staunch Thomists find rather dubious. It's the first sentence of step three. He says, hence, if all things are able not to be, then at some time or other, nothing was in reality. Some of you are probably aware that this, this portion of the third way has become a classic example of a certain kind of logical fallacy. It's called the quantifier shift fallacy. A recent logic textbook says, St. Thomas Aquinas argued, if everything at some time fails to exist, then there must be some one time at which everything fails to exist. Of course, Thomas, the actual text puts it in the past tense, but that's, kind of, that's not very pertinent. The idea is that Thomas is treating this statement, everything at some time was not, each thing at some time was not, as equivalent to the statement, at some time, everything was not. It's a gross error. That would be a very gross error. It would be like treating the statement, every Nobel Prize winner has been affiliated with a university, as equivalent to the statement, there is one university with which every Nobel Prize winner has been affiliated. And you know what that university is. <laughs> <laughs> so that statement may be true, but it is not at all equivalent to the previous statement. I honestly do not think that this is Thomas's reasoning. I don't think it can be. Think of this, you know, for one thing. As is well known, Thomas taught that God could have created a beginningless world, a world without beginning. But if he, if he had fallen into this fallacy, he would only be able to say that God could have made beginningless necessary beings. The whole class of contingent beings, the beings able not to be, would have to have had a beginning. In any case, at some time, no contingent being would have been, he would have to say. But he holds no such thing. He sees no incoherence in Aristotle's view that the series of earthly contingent things had no beginning. It's been going on forever. He judges that view wrong because of his faith, but he doesn't think it's incoherent. In fact, I think even in the text here, he gives us a sign that he is not slipping into the fallacy. Look at the Latin in step two. It says, quod possibili est, est non esse, quandoque non est. I've rendered quandoque with at some time. The first sentence of step three uses a different word, aliquando. Aliquando nil fuit in rebus. Now those two words, quandoque et aliquando, are nearly synonymous. But they do differ a little bit. At least according to Lewis and Short, aliquando sometimes means after a long expectation or delay. We could say eventually, sooner or later. Or as I've rendered it here, at some time or other. You can think of it this way. Assume that all the cows now living will die sometime. Obviously, they do not all need to die at the same time. But just as obviously, sooner or later, at some time or other, all of them will have died. And likewise, even if they were not all born at the same time, there was some time or other before which none of them was yet born. So, if all presently existing things are of this sort, then of course they may not all have begun at the same time. That would be the fallacy to assume that. But each one did begin at some time or other. And going backwards, eventually we come to the time before the oldest one began. And at that time, none of them was. If that's what Thomas means, then he certainly has not shifted any quantifiers. However, the other readers have found his reasoning here faulty in another way. They say that what can strictly be concluded is only that at some time 
no thing that is now was. There is no reason why the presently existing contingent things, all of which began to exist after some past time, could not have been preceded by other such things, things which have already passed away. And there is no reason why this sort of sequence could not go back into an infinite past. Now, if those who say this mean only that an infinite temporal series of contingent things is logically possible, then again, Thomas agrees. It's not a logical possibility. He does not deny the logical possibility of an infinite temporal series of contingent things. And if there is a God, if not everything is contingent, and if God had so willed, such a th series could really have existed. God could have kept it going. But Thomas is saying that if everything is contingent, and so there is no God, then an infinite series is impossible. Whatever keeps the, any series going would itself have only a finite duration. And in fact, not even a finite series would be possible because of what it, he goes on to say in, in step three. Quote, but if this were true, then even now nothing would be. For that which is not does not begin to be, except in virtue of something that is. So if nothing was a being, then it was impossible that anything should have begun to be, and so nothing would be now, which is plainly false. However, some critics grant that this is what he's saying, and that he is not denying the logical possibility of the infinite series, but they say his view depends on an obsolete physics. Thomas did not know the principle of the conservation of energy or of mass energy, or whatever it is. I'm not a physicist. I don't know what. But with this principle or something like it, there's no strict need for a god to keep the series going. The series may be able to keep going all on its own. Perhaps no individual thing is permanent. Perhaps not even any specific kind of thing is permanent. But common physical nature as such brings with it, or conceivably at least could bring with it, all that it takes for the series of things to go on indefinitely. Now, as a matter of fact, Thomas's own physics does contain a principle that could serve as a basis for almost the same objection. The principle is the corruption of one thing is the generation of another. Corruptio unius est generatio alterius. He says that many, many times. When a cow dies, the result is not sheer non-being. There is the carcass. Soon that ceases to be, and there is a hamburger. Maybe. Right. The hamburger ceases to be, and you now weigh a little more than you did. You can destroy a thing, but you cannot annihilate it. Right. You can't turn it into nothing at all. You can only turn it into a different thing. You deprive it of the form by which it exists, but at once its matter takes on another form. There is always matter. And there is always form, even though there is not always the same form. But this is really no objection at all. Readers sometimes take Thomas to be saying that everything in the visible world is contingent, able to be and able not to be. But the truth is that he finds much more necessity in the visible world than we do. As I've said, he thinks the sky is full of necessary beings. And although he considers individual terrestrial bodies contingent, he thinks that at least the overall system of bodily elements, earth, water, air, and fire, is quite indestructible. And nobody says that now, I think. Maybe they do, but I don't, I don't think so. So if we, do, if we do say that the law of energy conservation or matter or whatever ensures that the physical world will not fall into nothingness, we are, what are we saying? We're saying that there's something about the physical world that can go on indefinitely, something that is neither generable nor corruptible. We, we are saying that there's something necessary about it. We are saying what Thomas is, says in the, at the end of step three. Not all beings are able to be and not to be but something in reality must be necessary. So it's no objection. Notice, by the way, that at least for Thomas, I don't know about energy, but at least for Thomas, 
here too with matter, the, the natural love of being is at work. Matter, too, in its own way, desires to be, he says. Unlike a form, matter is rather indifferent as to what it is. Matter is happy to be anything, so to speak. But it is absolutely determined not to be nothing. It's got to be something. So I say that Thomas would be quite ready to allow that the physical world may have in itself what it takes to go on forever. But he would insist on the idea that comes out in step four. Now we move to step four. It says, now every necessary being either does or does not have a cause of its necessity from elsewhere. Physical nature may have in itself what it takes to go on forever, but it cannot have it independently. Whatever necessity there is in it must have a cause from elsewhere. That's what Thomas would say. Now, before going into how we might see that it needs a cause, let me say something about this general idea, the idea of necessary things whose necessity is caused. People are surprised often to learn that Thomas Aquinas, Christian theologian, thinks anything but God is or even can be necessary. How can anything but God be necessary if everything else is created and if, as Christians believe, creation had a beginning. How can a necessary being have begun to be? Before it began, it was not. Does that not imply that it was able not to be? And surely if at that time it was able not to be, it still is. But what is able not to be is not necessary, it's contingent. But once again, the distinction between the logical and the natural is really key. The being of a thing that begins to be is not logically necessary. Nothing that is logically necessary can begin to be. But for that, it was not, because that would imply a contradiction. The thing's not being involves no contradiction, such a thing. But what is not logically necessary may still be naturally necessary. It may have no power not to be but only power to be, and this for an unlimited duration. However, as Thomas points out in the De Celo commentary, such a thing's power to be can very well be something that the thing begins to have, namely when the thing itself begins to be. Once it begins and has its power, it can go on forever, but it has its power only once it begins. And he thinks that's how it is with the, with the heavens. They began to be, but they can go on forever. And in that sense, they're necessary. They have to go on forever. In, same pl in the same place in the De Cello comment commentary, Thomas says that God wanted everything to be, quote, after it was not, so as to show the excellence of his power, his virtus, over being as a whole, over totum ends, being as a whole. It shows that being as a whole depends on him alone and that his power is not bound or determined to the production of such a being. He can take it or leave it, so to speak. The beginning of things in time, in other words, shows God's utter self-sufficiency in being and his utter freedom in action. But by his action, he can and did produce beings of all kinds. Some of them are indestructible. He can make things that last. Now I can say something, at least in a sketchy way, about how we can see that whatever necessity there is in the physical world must have a cause of its necessity. Consider what we just heard just now about God. A necessary being that does not have a cause of its necessity outside itself is an utterly self-sufficient, utterly independent being. It must, such a being must be able to be whether or not anything else at all exists. But there's nothing physical that's like that. Even if one or more physical principles, matter or energy or whatever you like, 
is necessary, it does not and cannot exist by itself. It has the nature of a part or a component. For it's always open to, it's, but the very fact that it's involved in change means that it's open to conditions or determinations that are distinct from it and add something to it. Such a thing can be thought of in abstraction from any of its determinations. Matter, we can think of matter somehow in an abstraction from this form or that form. And we can maybe can think of energy just as energy, not any particular type of energy. But there's no such thing as matter without form in Thomas's ontology. And there, I think there's no such thing as energy that it's no particular type of energy. However necessary it is, it has the nature of a, of a kind of part, a component, a factor in a whole system. It is not self-sufficient. And that means it must have a cause from elsewhere. It can't be something that is necessary just by itself. And neither is the whole system self-sufficient. That's clear because the system depends on its parts, the physical system. The parts cannot entirely account for each other that would constitute a vicious circle. A accounts for B and B accounts for A. That's a vicious circle. And a vicious circle is a type of infinite regress, going on and on and never coming to a, a first. Thomas rules out an infinite regress of causes in step five. However, as he indicates there, this move is not proper to the third way. He cites the second way. It is not possible to go to infinity and necessary beings that have a cause of their necessity from elsewhere, just as this is not possible in efficient causes, as was proved in the second way. For this reason, I'm not going to go into the question of the infinite regress. I'm going to excuse myself from that top. We can talk about it in the, in the, in the questions, but I'm, it's not proper to the third way. It's not a pro issue. It's strictly a third way issue. But assuming that the infinite regress can be excluded, we are left with the need to posit something that is necessary in virtue of itself, I'm quoting the third way, step five, not having a cause of its necessity from elsewhere, but that is a cause of necessity for the others. So what I wish to consider just in the, in the few minutes remaining is how we should conceive of this being that is necessary in virtue of itself. I think it's very tempting to suppose that here, finally, we should bring in the notion of logical necessity. Some people just say that. God is the one being whose not being involves a contradiction. And Thomas does hold that. In fact, he said it a few pages earlier. The truth that God exists, he said, is in itself is per se nota. That is, the predicate pertains to the very notion of the subject. And that is because God or what God is, his essence, is identical with his existence or with his being. But if this is how we understand that which is necessary in virtue of itself, then those words of Heidegger that we saw at the start do have a bearing on the third way. What is the causa sui that Heidegger is talking about, if not this, that whose essence entails its existence? This is the text from Spinoza on the back, text E, the very beginning of the ethics. By cause of itself, I mean that whose essence involves existence, or that whose nature cannot be conceived except as existing. Spinoza's causa sui is necessary with logical necessity. And about it, I'm inclined to agree with Heidegger. It's not much of a god, I think. But I do not think that this is how the third way means for us to take the being that is necessary in virtue of itself, at least not at first. We should not jump immediately to logical necessity. If we do, we miss something. We should continue thinking in terms of natural necessity. That is, we should consider that this being too, indeed this being most of all, has virtus ascendi, form and power to be, to the total exclusion of matter and power not to be. And this being also has appetite, love of being, 
This being too is necessary in the sense of being able to be forever and tending to be just as much and just as long as he can. And Thomas says, and this is a God. How can we be sure that God has this love? Thomas would say by the very universality of this love. This is my last text, text F. What accompanies every being pertains to a being inasmuch as it is a being. And what is of this sort must be found most of all in that which is the first being, God. Now, it belongs to each and every being to be inclined toward its perfection and the conservation of, of its existence, each in its own way, to intellectual beings through the will, to animals through sense appetite, and to beings lacking sense through physical tendency. But it belongs differently to those that have and to those that have not. Those that have not tend by desire toward obtaining what they lack. Those that have rest in it. So this cannot be lacking to the first being, which is God. And therefore, since he is intelligent, there is will in him by which he is pleased at his existence and his goodness. Does this make God too much like the other beings, especially the necessary ones? Does it make him just kind of a first among equals? I think really if we pushed it, we could see that it does just the opposite because it ties into Thomas's very distinctive way of displaying God's absolute transcendence. That is, his transcendence not merely in relation to other beings, but his transcend transcendence in relation to being itself, what Heidegger is talking about, being. Mm -hmm. I can only sketch the idea very briefly in two minutes, and then I'm done. This will serve for a conclusion. The crucial point is this. A being that is necessary in virtue of itself must be totally simple. Unlike the physical world, it can have no parts or components of any sort. And hence, in this being and in it alone, form and power and love and all other perfections, including his very act of being, his existence, are all absolutely identical with each other and with him because he's simple. And therefore, it is not true, as Heidegger's text insinuates, that while God grounds the being of everything else, being itself grounds God as his essence. It is not true for Thomas that being itself is God's essence. Being itself, we can say, is only being. But God's essence is not only being. It is being, but it is also form, and it's also power, and it's also wisdom, and it's goodness, and it's love, and the perfect exemplar of every single thing. And it is not the synthesis of these perfections, because it's not a synthesis. It's simple. So it cannot be identified with the essence of any of them, not even with the essence of being itself. It lies beyond them all and beyond our power to conceive, a simple form that is all those things. We can't conceive it. And it is their source. So the divine nature is not the nature of being itself. It is the cause of that nature, the cause that accounts for it. So to close, let us not also forget, let us also not forget how it stands with God's love. It's a spiritual love, of course, the kind that belongs to the will, as we saw, God's will always has what it loves, and so it is always pleased. Thomas calls the will's pleasure gaudium, joy. Thomas's God is a pure, eternal, subsisting act of joy. And it is out of his joy that he made the world. It seems to me that before such a God, one can very well play music and dance and fall to one's knees in awe. Thank you. <laughs>